Good morning, everyone. We will start the webinar in about one minute to allow some more folks to get on and join. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Calvin Sharfs and I am the VP of Product Marketing at Pixelate and I am your moderator today. We are pleased to be presenting Navigating Safety, Privacy and Compliance in CTV Programmatic Advertising. And we are honored to have a couple of guests, Shai Samit, Founder and President of KidSafe SIL Program and Dan Riddell, CTO of Kadoodle TV. Uh, as you can see, we will have questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you would like to ask any questions, please submit those in the webinar window and we will answer as many as we can at the end. Again, I'm Calvin Sharfs, VP of Product Marketing at Pixelate. I'm a dedicated ad tech and MarTech technology executive with over 20 years of experience managing products, marketing, operations, sales, and personnel. And my past experiences range from working with Fortune 500 companies to small startups. Hi everyone, I... I'm Dan Riddell and I'm the Chief Technology Officer over here at Canoodle TV. Um, you know, I've been in uh, technology now for over 20 years with a focus on OTT for the last decade and ad tech and safe streaming for families since 2015. And hi everyone, I am Shai Samit. I run KidSafe, which is a SEAL program catered exclusively for kids and family technologies. Uh, we have hundreds of members worldwide and we advise and help them comply with best practices for online safety as well as uh, legal requirements such as COPPA here in the US. That's great. I'm gonna do a really quick introduction of Pixelate. Pixelate is an ad fraud market monitoring and marketing compliance platform. We are MRC accredited uh, across CTV, mobile in-app and desktop mobile web. And we offer pre-blocking products uh, for the ad tech ecosystem as well as analytics and a media ratings terminal for the programmatic supply chain intelligence that we'll be talking about today. We also often publish research and education for the industry in our blogs. Uh, so please consider subscribing to those reports. And uh, welcome everyone. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, Kadoodle TV is a world leading safe streaming platform for kids and families. Uh, we have over 30,000 episodes of curated content. Curated meaning that we have human moderators review all of the programming content that airs on the service. Um, we're safe streaming, we're COPA and GDPRK compliant. We are a member of the Kids Safe Seal program that, that Shai and his company operate. Uh, we have a pretty big uh, reach across a number of different devices, including mobile and CTV, uh, with a global reach of over 12 million uh, monthly active users in 160 plus countries. Uh, we rank very highly in Pixelate's uh, uh, Publisher Trust Index uh, for Roku, and uh, you can learn more about Kadoodle TV by visiting our website at kadoodle.tv. Great. Thanks, Dan. And I can vouch for the fact that Kadoodle is a great uh, member of ours, so appreciate your uh, participation. So as I mentioned earlier, KidSafe is a seal of approval program. We offer a, a number of badges that align with best practices for online safety as well as uh, legal requirements such as uh, the COPPA rule, the FTC COPPA rule that enforces the COPPA statute. We are an FTC Federal Trade Commission approved COPPA Safe Harbor program, which means that any businesses, whether it's a website, a mobile app, uh, a connected uh, smart TV app, a connected device, AR, VR, virtually every uh, vertical in the kids' uh, digital space, even ed tech, uh, that receives our COPPA certification is shielded from the threat of FTC enforcement. And we'll talk some more about that 
a bit later in the presentation. Uh, we have hundreds of members worldwide. Uh, we're not limited in, in any stretch uh, to the U U.S. market. In fact, a very large percentage of our members are based outside the U.S. And through our badges uh, that we issue to our members, we generate uh, close to 200 seal impressions per month, uh, reaching 200 countries, and, and generate about a million uh, unique visits to our site per month. So the, the badge is kind of our, our way of, uh, word of word of mouth, if you will, and really drives participation, increased participation in our program, which we feel is very important for industry. Thanks, Dan and Shai. I appreciate those introductions. It's good to uh, know a little bit about each of you and your companies. Um, we're one of our privacy reports um, we did was stating the privacy in the first half of 2021. So we wanted to set the table a little bit, kind of high level on what we found in that. So, so here are some of the data points from our measurements um, from the mobile app store. So this is Google um, Play in the Apple App Store. As you can see, nearly 90% of all the apps in both stores count children age 12 and under as part of their audience. Um, this is based off of their content advisories as, as it's reported in those stores. Interestingly enough, nearly 10% of those apps are privately registered, which means that there is no data on who, who the actual uh, publisher is. So there is some question on wh why, why that is hidden, um, privacy reasons for their own, but also if there's issues that they may have. There's also anywhere from 16 to 22% of the apps have no privacy policy, or at least one that we cannot detect um, as we do our methods of detection. Google did recently announce it will require privacy policies on all publishers by April, 2022, which seems interesting that it's next year, but not sooner. And Apple claims that it already has and requires them, but we, we've not been able to detect, in, in that case, 16% from that side. So interestingly enough, these are why we're, we're concentrating and looking at these particular issues because we see some holes and gaps in, in the marketplace here. Next slide. Okay, Calvin, if I can just add to that, on, on the privacy policy front, what I find interesting about that statistic is that several years back, there were settlements between the Federal Trade Commission and each of the app store uh, owners, uh, including Google, uh, Apple and even Amazon. And one of the things that came out of that settlement was that, uh, in, which was more focused on the lack of control around in-app purchases or the lack of transparency around which apps have in-app purchases and, and the like. And one of the things that came out of those settlements was the expectation, I and I believe the requirement, that the app stores would require developers to have a link to their privacy policy. So when you say that Google is now requiring it as of April 2022. It seems like that is way beyond the uh, <clears throat> the time period that they were given allotted in the original settlement. But what I've noticed as well is that even though they have this privacy policy link requirement within the App Store listing for each app, many of them, and I know that the team at Kitsay can vouch for this, don't even link to a privacy policy. Uh, they might link to the developer's website or legal terms of use. Uh, and so the enforcement around this has been minimal within the App Store environment. <clears throat> so I guess moving on to the state of privacy uh, in the first half of, of 2021, and I know Dan will have some thoughts to share uh, about this, but there's a few things I think to note about the landscape. Uh, first off, with the new administration in the White House, we are seeing changes at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, most notably, uh, there's a new con uh, commissioner, her name is Lena Khan, who was appointed as a fourth commissioner, and actually the, technically the fifth, and she um, she comes from a very pro-regulatory -regu uh, background. Uh, she's not a big fan of safe harbors, uh, like our own program, um, out of concern for the inability for uh, self-regulation to work. And so, uh, and she's very pro enforcement. And so I think, and she has become immediately the chairwoman at the Federal Trade Commission. So as her first position at the commission, she has become the chairwoman on the uh, on the commission. And so that means that she has a lot of power to dictate kind of the direction 
of the Federal Trade Commission going forward. So I think that's that's one important consideration. Uh, another is Rohit Chopra, who is one of the other commissioners at the uh, commission, is on his way out, uh, most likely, has been uh, um, uh, elected or designated for another position at the White House. So uh, it's likely that his role will be filled with a, uh, a, similar, a similar role. Secondly, uh, I don't have to share this with the folks on this call, but we're certainly seeing increased enforcement uh, across really all privacy regulations, but especially COPPA. There was uh, a, an enforcement action just last month uh, involving uh, a coloring app, which thought it was directed to the general audience, to the masses, but discovered that many kids were using its app and uh, was not complying with COPPA. And we expect to see more enforcement of COPPA with the new commission in place. Uh, we're also seeing quite a bit of enforcement around GDPR, and we won't get into the details, but I think everyone has seen the announcement uh, related to the Amazon case and the size of the fine or the proposed fine uh, in that case. So we're certainly seeing more enforcement around GDPR. We haven't seen too much in the GDPR kids arena, but I suspect that we will with the age appropriate design code out of the UK uh, now coming into force on September 1 of this year. So I anticipate that we'll uh, start to see some enforcement around that too. And then finally, uh, on the state level, we're seeing a lot of activity as well. And we can jump to the next slide to talk about some of those. So CCPA has been in place now in California for a little while. We also now have similar laws in Virginia, the CDPA, and in Colorado, the CPA. So virtually every acronym will be used by the time we're done across the uh, uh, the United States of America. But uh, if this trend continues, I think what we're going to see is the need for a federal, a federal privacy bill, of which there have been many over the years. But if there's any time that there's a good chance a federal privacy bill can pass, it's probably now. So to the extent that we see more state laws, uh, varying state laws, although most of these are modeled off of the GDPR, uh, but to the extent that we see more of the more of these and variants between them, there likely will need uh, be the need to have preemption at the federal level. We're also seeing a lot of activity at the global uh, level. So GDPR kids, as as Dan uh, mentioned earlier, Article Eight of of GDPR um, pertains to kids. Um, Information society services is what they're called, and there are some similarities to COPPA there, although there are some unique requirements that pertain to businesses that have European residents as their end users. Uh, the AADC stands for the Age Appropriate Design Code out of, uh, out of the UK. Uh, LGPD is a new federal privacy law that is coming to effect in Brazil and is similar to the G GDPR, but also has provisions that pertain to the handling of data from children users. And the PISS is the personal information security specification that is a voluntary uh, standard out of China, but also has some requirements pertaining to, uh, to children. So this is sort of the landscape that we should be looking at. If you're a business operating uh, in the mobile space, in the connected TV space, and you're making your apps available to all of these regions, these are the laws that you need to take into account uh, as you build for, uh, for those regions. Next slide. Thank you, Shai. Thanks, Shai, that's great. Um, so just to set the table a little bit, um, it's important to define OTT and CTV. I'm sure everyone knows, but we'll do a refresher on that. And this goes across both the mobile advertising and CTV advertising. Because like Dan and Shai say, most people have multiple apps across the different platforms, uh, not only from connected TV, but in mobile. So OTT, we define as streaming content that can be viewed on multiple devices. It can be computers, mobile, connected TVs. And CTV is the connection through the internet built to the connectivity through your smart TV or some third party device like Roku or Apple TV. So Hulu can have a mobile app and have OTT content on mobile advertising and Hulu can have an Apple TV OTT content on CTV advertising. 
I know those sometimes those get mixed and are set set synonymously, but that's how we, we're looking at and defining those. So content risks for mobile and CTV. We're going to shift gears a little bit here. We're going to talk about uh, what that means, what the content risks are broken down, and we'll turn uh, the time over to Dan to talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Calvin, and thank you, Shai. Great overview. So, you know, what are the privacy basics on mobile and CTV? I mean, there's, I think, this misconception in the marketplace that, you know, you can't uh, track any data related to this ecosystem if you're dealing with children, and, and that's not the case. I mean, you are allowed to to track data for the purpose of understanding how your campaigns are performing, for understanding, uh, you know, service analytics and those types of things. What you're not allowed to do is target against those data points. And so, you know, at Kadoodle TV, what we've done is we have a data collection policy, which is very context uh, specific. Uh, we aggregate our data, we pass along things like device IDs and IP addresses in programmatic advertising calls with uh, a do not track flag or a COPA flag to signal to other parties not to, to target these users on the basis of behavior. Uh, but we have also become very contextual. So we send a lot of contextual data points in our ad calls. Uh, you know, we pass the programming title that's being viewed at the time. The age range of the programming that our moderation team feels is appropriate for that content and um you know also uh the gender skew that we think is appropriate as moderated by our our content team so we deem that programs can be uh, neutral or or female audience skewed or male audience skewed and we pass those contextual uh data points within uh our ad calls um i think another thing is that you know, content providers need to understand the performance of their content. You know, they need to understand how many unique viewers they get and in what regions they come from because it helps them to make better informed decisions on the types of content that they produce, you know, thus making the overall ecosystem for, for children's and families safer. And so we've recently launched our content analytics uh, portal to uh, a beta selection of our producers that we work with at Kadoodle TV. And they're now getting real-time analytics on the performance of their content across multiple regions. And if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, what are some of the brand safety and advertising risks that we need to navigate as both publishers and advertisers in the space? You know, I think one of the things that we've really done at Kadoodle TV is we've understood our audience through, you know, a number of different research papers that we've commissioned and, and we can share those research papers with any attendees that would like to see them. But uh, what we found is that, you know, more and more, especially through and post pandemic, uh, parents and, and caregivers are viewing with their children. Uh, our data shows that at least 70% uh, of the time, Parents are within earshot of programming that children are we are, are uh, watching, and over 50% of the time, you know, actively co-viewing in the same room with their kids on CTV devices. And so, what we've done is we've built out an ecosystem that addresses not only the children in the audience but also the parents and caregivers in the audience from an advertising perspective. Uh, so, what we like to do is we like to, you know, try to balance the types of ads that we show to be approximately you know 60 percent endemic to children audiences and 40 percent uh, appropriate to to the adults that may be watching and that could include things like uh, consumer packaged goods brands or uh, automotive uh, commercials and those types of things on mobile devices it's it's quite clear that the audience is is very much leaned in and that it's most likely just a child that is watching at that point and so the ad experience is very different on mobile at Kadoodle TV. We show only one ad in an ad break as opposed to uh, two to four ads in an ad break on connected TV. And that one ad that we show is, is endemic to kids. And of course, all ads are labeled in all ecosystems. You know, that's a requirement of, of COPA that ads be labeled and that advertising be uh, easily distinguished to the audience. Uh, one of the things that we built out, uh, you know, that really allows for that co-viewing advertising, uh, and if we move to the next slide, I think we're talking about creative review there. 
no, okay, well, we'll go back. I'll get into our creative review technology uh, in a bit here. Um, hey, Dan, one quick, the, question, quick question for you. How long has this pro process taken for you to get right? I mean, it's a lot of big hurdles and a lot of things. Um, is it, it, it's hard to get into? Is it easier now? What, what's your kind of thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it was definitely a learning curve for us and, and Shy and the, the Kids Safe Seal program have definitely helped us out along the way. You know, they go through a very extensive audit of all of our apps in all of the ecosystems. And that audit, you know, I, I think, Shy, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're measuring over 500, you know, different, you know, data points or or practices that we can adhere to. So, you know, it's a very extensive uh, uh, checklist and, and Shai and his team have really helped us to understand the do's and don'ts of COPA. And maybe if we just slide forward uh, two slides, uh, we can get into some of those, those do's and don'ts. Yeah, so we'll uh, go into the next here. We're gonna talk uh, privacy compliance best practices um, for OTT and CTV advertising. And we'll have both Dan and Shai talk about that. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, the best practices to look for in COPA compliant publishers, you know, you have to have a privacy policy that complies with COPA, you know, GDPRK, CCPA, the various uh, regulations that are out there. Um, you know, in regards to under 13 audiences, it's very important that you receive parental consent, uh, verified parental consent to use uh, an app. You need to assure that the children are able to identify ads as ads. So all ads are clearly labeled within our platform as advertisements. And you need to protect, protect children's personal data uh, by not sharing it with third parties. And by not sharing it with third parties, we mean not sharing it with third parties you know, for the purpose of targeting. You can send uh, what could be considered to be PII, like an IP address or a device ID in an ad call but you have to send appropriate signaling to your ad provider at the same time to indicate that this is an audience that's not to be tracked. Um, what you can't do, you can't entice children to divulge personal information. Uh, you know, so for instance, uh, rewarded activity uh, within a platform that collects personal information. Um, you're not allowed to collect information that's personal period, unless it's for a legitimate business purpose. So, uh, you know, uh, collecting uh, a child's name under a, a profile, for instance, a Kadoodle TV, a registered user, uh, which is a family, can have multiple profiles. Those profiles could be, you know, children's names, and those names could be considered to be personal information. You know, that's fine. That's that's to create a profile so that a family can distinguish amongst can distinguish them. Amongst legitimate business. Legitimate business. Can you guys and, hear me? Because my my audio went uh, down for a second. Okay, great. Um, yep. Yeah, I just, I just have a, if I can interject just for a moment and, and go back uh, a couple slides, you don't have to move the slides back, but in the context of this conversation, you mentioned co-viewing. What in particular about mobile versus CTV has you believe that in the CTV context, there's more of a co-viewing experience? Is there something sort of factual or something about the experience itself that the fact that the TV is in the family room, like what in particular uh, how do you believe that uh, in CTV, it's more of a co-viewing experience? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's mainly our, our research points, Shai. You know, we've worked with a uh, uh, research firm out of Washington, D.C. to conduct a number of different studies on our audience. And what that those studies have found is that, by and large, families are co-viewing on that connected TV device. On a mobile mm -hmm. device, uh, you know, the co-viewing isn't happening to as large of an extent, although it does happen from time to time. But we take, you know, the stance at Google TV that we assume that that's a, a leaned in individual child or, or two children on that tablet or phone and thus, you know, skew the advertising and the experience toward that. Uh, you know, on the connected TV front, uh, you know, and happy to happy to share the uh, studies with you, uh, but there is, you know, a significant co-viewing angle. And, and not only that, our research shows that parents want to see ads that are, are not only appropriate to their children, but appropriate mm. to them as well. And, you know, that's because, you know, imagine as a parent, if, if every ad that they saw was for a toy or to go to a theme park or something like that, uh, you know, the, the asks uh, to the parents, the, the list gets long. So when you mix up that advertising, uh, it seems to uh, calm down uh, the, the children a little bit. 
Thank you for that. For sure. Uh, last couple points here. You can't blur the lines between content and advertisements. So, you know, for instance, a lot of uh, brands in the endemic kids space are also content producers. So at Cadoodle TV, uh, you know, we have technology that prevents, uh, for instance, a Paw Patrol ad from appearing within Paw Patrol programming because that type of uh, advertisements could be considered uh, confusing to to children audiences, specific, specifically younger ones. And you're not allowed to do any types of in-app purchase unless it's with verified parental consent. And uh, you know, there's a number of ways to get verified parental consent, but but uh, you know, it's it's definitely uh, a dicey subject. And you know, we take the position that in-app purchases uh, can only be done uh, via our website and via a, a signed-in user. So there's no ability for a user to, for instance, sign up to the subscribed version of Google TV on a mobile or CTV environment because, you know, even things like pins and age gates uh, in some places could be considered not verified uh, parental consent. Mind if we uh, stay on this slide for a, a, a couple minutes longer? I'd, I'd like to just add to some of the points that Dan has made around best sure. practices for uh, for COPPA compliant publishers. So, you know, if you look on the right-hand side, as far as avoiding enticing children to divulge personal information by the prospect of a game, prize, or other offer, I mean, we see, increasingly, we're seeing, at least in sort of casual games that are more mixed audience that has a subset of users that are under 13, but also has a very large 13 plus user base. We're seeing reward-based video ads appear uh, more often. And this is more, more so in the mobile context than it is in CTV. It may not be long before it hits CTV, but we're seeing playable ads, right? Ads that have a game that you actually experiment with, but also watching videos for the sake of earning coins or prizes or, or some kind of reward within the game that you're playing. And very often, the advertiser and publisher or developer in this case, first party app developer, assumes that just the play button for that video is known to children as an ad when it really should be marked or labeled an ad in the context of children. Otherwise, it might be seen as, as exploitative of, of children uh, and not knowing kind of the distinction between what's part of the game and what's not part of the game. Uh, what's part of this? app that I'm that I'm playing with and what's not. And so, you know, to the extent that again, blurring the lines, and this relates to, to the third point there about blurring the lines, I think that can't be overemphasized because it is critical for purposes of being seen as uh, as child friendly. For sure. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So at Cadoodle TV, we've built an extensive, what we call creative review process. So every piece of programming and every advertisement that airs on our service is moderated by humans uh, to assure the safety for family audiences. Um, our creative review process essentially allows us to tap into the open auction market, programmatic advertising. Uh, we're the only kids and family publisher that's integrated to DV360's open market. And that's because of the creative review technology that we've built. So what we're doing essentially is we're intercepting all of the vast responses that we get from each of our demand partners when we make an ad call. Uh, we're taking a digital fingerprint of the media file that's being returned in that uh, vast response, as well as a hash of the uh, creative ID that's being returned. Um, we're then subjecting that media file to human moderation. So our moderation team consists of eight moderators across multiple time zones. At any given time, we have two moderators working and they are lo looking for all sorts of things. So, uh, you know, from a brand safety perspective, for instance, political advertising could be considered sensitive. You know, Colgate and, and other brands uh, may not want certain political parties' messages aligning next to theirs. So we block all political ads, we block all religious content, we block any ads that depict uh, people drinking alcohol, for instance, or smoking. Um, we block all types of gambling ads. And what we see, or what we found through experience, uh, you know, in the past, because we didn't always do things this way, 
is we used to just pass a COPA flag in an ad call. And that COPA flag is supposed to signal, you know, to the ad networks, you know, please don't track the user of this data and please return a creative that's appropriate for the audience. And what we were finding is that we were getting, even with a COPA flag, creatives being returned that weren't appropriate for the audience. And so, you know, we invented this creative review process. Uh, we explored, you know, the legislation. The, the regulatory framework a bit more. And we found that, you know, COPA, you know, the essence of COPA is to not track uh, uh, children's data. And so a do not track flag uh, as a signal or a limit ad tracking flag as a signal is just as effective from a regulatory perspective as a COPA flag, provided you have some type of a, a moderation layer in there to ensure that, you know, creatives coming back are appropriate for the audience. And so, uh, what we're doing today is approximately 2,000 unique creatives being moderated by our moderation team. Um, you know, approximately 40% of those are blocked for various reasons, uh, but the 60% that do flow through are, are a great selection of local ads. And, you know, a proper creative review process, I think, allows local advertising to make it through to premium CTV publishers because the way that uh, you know, advertising is traditionally bought in the CTV space is via programmatic guarantees or, or PMP type deals. And the reality is, is that local advertisers are often running micro campaigns. You know, they can't afford the budgets to work with premium publishers on that PMP or programmatic guarantee basis. And so, you know, if publishers were to adopt, uh, you know, scalable creative review technologies, you know, that really allows them to tap into a much wider funnel of revenue and, in our opinion, more appropriate ads for those local audiences. We can move to the next slide, please. Hey, just a reminder, everyone, to uh, type in your questions. Um, we'll be able to answer those in, in uh, 10 minutes or so here. So uh, go ahead and submit those. Thanks, Calvin. So I'll talk to this slide. I do want to, if, if, with your permission, go back one slide and, and just highlight uh, something around brand safety versus privacy that, that Dan has already alluded to, but I think uh, is important in the context of kind of seeing what happens in version 3.0 of COPPA, which I'll, which I'll talk about shortly. But that is that brand safety can clash with privacy, right? As Dan mentioned, COPPA is a data collection law. It's a parental consent law. And as long as I have parental consent, or as long as I'm avoiding a form of tracking that would be seen as privacy invasive, then I'm technically COPPA compliant. And what doesn't matter in, in the COPPA realm, in the COPPA conversation, is whether the ad content is appropriate or not. As long as the ad is not being served based on my behavior across different apps, right, belonging to different companies. So it's really focused on the privacy concern. But if you think about it, and, and this is something that we've lobbied for, I should say, in our comments to the Federal Trade Commission about the new COPPA law that will be proposed shortly, is that, uh, you, you know, we need to think about the consequences of over-regulating with respect to not allowing any form of trackers. Because there are times when if, if my child is on a CTV experience and they watch one show and then they go to the next show, right? If they're being tracked and served an ad for the show that they previously viewed, it's likely that that ad is gonna be more appropriate for them, not less appropriate from a content standpoint, right? Um, I always like to say that I'm much more comfortable on a web browser seeing an ad for a product that I've previously shopped for on Amazon than a completely randomized contextual ad that may or may not be appropriate for my family. So there are times where actually targeted ads, in theory, could actually be more appropriate for my family from a content standpoint than a completely contextual, contextually served ads um, in that same experience. So it's important to keep that in mind. And, you know, one another good example of this is on YouTube. A lot of the YouTube kids channels today can't be very creative anymore in the types of ads that they show on their content. And all we're really seeing is Grammarly ads and Verbo ads, right? Um, and what's interesting is that if you go to Grammarly and you go to Verbo, those sites are not meant for kids. And those sites have trackers. 
Hmm. Think about that for a moment, right? The sites that are now, the, the ads that are now contextually served are completely irrelevant or mostly irrelevant to the child himself or herself. And so now we're through this new approach, almost forcing them to go to sites that have the trackers that we're trying to avoid in the first place. So it's very complicated and complex when it comes to getting this right. And these are granularities that I think even the smartest uh, people on Capitol Hill don't really understand and get, unfortunately. Next slide. That's it. That's a not taking into account, Shai, that your kid might actually need help with their grammar, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Although I'm, I'm not sure Grammarly is meant for kids, uh, per se. It's so not. My, most of us don't need to work on our own grammar, that's for sure. Well, with that, with that background, um, you know, the question that comes up a lot is, you know, how do we harmonize compliance uh, in, the, in the global ecosystem of regulations, right? Uh, we have GDPR in Europe, and we have sort of local laws within Europe, including some new codes like the Age Appropriate Design Code. We have various um, age cutoffs, even within Europe, depending on the country in which you're operating, from 13 to 14 to 15 and even 16. Um, you have the new LGBT law in Brazil. Uh, you have varying state laws here in the US and, and some other laws. And what, what do you do about all of these? And I think you know, that one thing I learned at, at Deloitte and Touche years ago when I was there for a couple of years helping them start up a, a consulting practice in Los Angeles, this goes back to 2004, is that you can't be compliant with everything, right? If you can meet 80% of the requirements globally, you're in a very good position as far as sort of risk mitigation. And we have found that, that and one of the reasons you're seeing COPPA here in the center is that COPPA still appears to be sort of the gold standard. COPPA is more stringent with respect to the form of parental consent or the verifiability of consent that you might need to get from a parent. Uh, COPPA is more, has all of the parental access rights uh, that we're now seeing in the GDPR and the LGBT and, and other, and other uh, regulations. COPPA has a data deletion standard and it always has had that standard. Uh, you know, sort of the right to be forgotten equivalent in Europe or in the CCPA, uh, the right of removal to take down content uh, you know, that you post online. So COPPA tends to be the gold standard. And if you're meeting the COPPA requirements, you're in a very good position vis-a-vis -vis these other jurisdictions. And so that's, that, that has been our guidance all along. Of course, there are nuances that you need to address in some of the other countries. But if you start with COPPA and then address sort of the, the, um, the caveats or, the, or the, you know, the, the specific requirements, unique requirements in the other regions, that tends to be the best approach to harmonize compliance. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's really the approach we've taken at Caboodle TV, Shy, is you know, following the Kids Safe Seal program, getting that uh, COPPA compliance, and then for the other jurisdictions, following their specific caveats, which mainly pertain to you know, data storage and deletion, and you know, the fact that that data needs to be stored and deleted deleted on request in the user's respective regions. Um, but, but yeah, you know, the gold standard is definitely COPPA. And as a publisher, uh, you know, working with Shy and KidSave, getting that COPPA seal definitely makes our steps into those other jurisdictions a lot, a lot smoother. I mean, another good example, you know, just, just to call out a couple more details is under the GDPRK and GDPR Article 8 section, you have, or not Article 8 in particular, but under GDPR, you have the right of portability, right? You'd be able to transport your data, transfer your data um, from one place to another, or even receive it from the operator. And that's not a COPPA specific requirement, but yet under COPPA, there's the idea of data minimization, right? And most companies are trying to avoid the collection and storing of, of identifiable data from children in the first place, such that having a, you know, to make the data portable is not typically something that's relevant in our in our industry yeah and i mean to that point shy i mean i mentioned earlier in the presentation that we do pass certain information like device ids and ip addresses we also have you know a set of middleware that we've ar architected here at canoodle tv we call it analytics anonymous 
but essentially what it's doing is it's anonymizing those data points that we send off to advertisers uh, before we're storing it within our ecosystem for the purpose of you know understanding analytics and that type of thing so you know when we're running our analytics in our various internal dashboards you know we're looking at fully anonymized data you know that's never been stored in an unanonymized fashion within our within our stack well let, let's talk about that more on the next slide because i think that's uh that's a good point you make and it's actually the first bullet here that i wanted to highlight when you when you look at what's being overlooked in in privacy and privacy compliance and you know there's this perception uh, of non-compliance that comes up when apps and sites particularly apps in, in the mobile ecosystem and now ctv as well are being viewed by advocacy groups watchdog groups uh, academia that are looking to kind of find violators and report them to the federal trade commission and a lot of times, if there's trackers, if there are trackers, regardless of how they're being used, how identifiable they are, right, and what's the scope of their use, those kinds of apps will be picked up in a, in a study and presented to the Federal Trade Commission. And as you pointed out, Dan, earlier, the COPPA law, for example, does allow for you to collect and even store in identifiable form persistent identifiers for limited purposes, for permissible purposes. As long as you're not linking it to other personal data elements like an email address, which should not be taken lightly because that does, you know, we've seen some analytics tools allow for the storage of an email identifier and linking it to a persistent identifier or the storage of precise geolocation and linking it to a persistent identifier. But if you keep those segmented, right? If you're only collecting and processing a persistent identifier, and even if you're not anonymizing it and you have no other personal information, you can store that information for purposes of first party analytics, mm -hmm. as an example, for ad capping purposes, right, under COPPA without running afoul of the COPPA law. And, and so um, oftentimes, again, you know, if, if someone goes to a website and uses a tool like Ghostery or goes to an app and uses some kind of scanning uh, SDK scanning tool, you might find lots of third-party SDKs and lots of third-party trackers, all of which are being used within the permissible realm of the internal support exemption of COPPA, which Dan highlighted earlier, but yet there's an appearance and a perception of non-compliance. And a lot of these companies are getting scooped up and being referred to the Federal Trade Commission, only then to, in some cases, come to us for us to inform the FTC of how, in fact, the trackers are legitimately being used, and therefore there's no violation of concern. But this is, I can't highlight this enough. Perception of non-compliance is critical. And when you look at um, some of the companies we're working with and, and the industry as a whole, you know, get the small things right. You know, have, make sure you have a privacy policy and it has the disclosures that are required under COPPA and GDPR. Because if you don't, you know, make sure that the privacy policy has an appropriate effective date, was recently updated. Because these are all red flags potentially for a deeper compliance issue. Even if there are no deeper compliance issues, it might cause unwarranted investigations, inquiries, letters from the Federal Trade Commission, which can be expensive to defend. So even if you're doing everything right on the back end, it's important to make sure that you have an appearance of compliance as well, not just technical compliance. Uh, there was actually not too long ago, a CTV app uh, company that received an inquiry from the Federal Trade Commission. The, Fed tra the Federal Trade Commission found no violation whatsoever. They just, they were interested to see whether the CTV industry is doing things right. Um, and turns out that that company was certified by us. The FTC hadn't realized that, and so they closed uh, they closed the letter immediately. And I'll talk uh, about the importance of that in just a moment. Um, I think the second thing uh, that's critical and, and often overlooked in privacy is, is managing third party risk. And I've already touched on on this in my previous points. First party app developers bear liability for third party vendors. You know, it doesn't matter where those third parties are, what functions they're performing. If they're performing a service on your behalf, 
if their SDK is embedded within your app, you are accountable for anything that they do or don't do or any mistakes that they make. So manage, managing that risk is, is important, but uh, more important than that is that it's actually having some kind of process to conduct due diligence, to, you know, whether it's a questionnaire, whether it's contractual assurances to vet their practices and then periodic checks on what they're doing, right? What data elements are they collecting? What are they processing? Is is going to be your your you know your first line of defense if the FTC comes knocking on your door. The FTC doesn't expect companies to get everything right and to to always be fully compliant, but they do expect you to have a program in place to address these kinds of risks. And if you do that, you'll be in good shape. If uh, if uh, and and out of harm's way with the Federal Trade Commission and. I know, and the last point I want to make here, and I know this is cliche and is somewhat self-serving and, you know, might seem like I'm tooting my horn, but I'm really not. You know, you can go anywhere else other than KidSafe, but getting independent verification of your compliance is going to demonstrate your good faith effort to comply. If you think that your lawyers are great and you have the best in-house legal staff or outside counsel, that might be true. But if you don't have an independent set of eyes, and in our case, a safe harbor, accreditation from the Federal Trade Commission, if there's an inadvertent violation, you're not protected, no matter how good, how good your lawyers are or how, or how good your privacy policy is. So getting certified is definitely highly recommended. Yeah, and I think just on that note, I mean, I'm sure some of the audience is familiar with the Publisher Trust Index. I mean, you do have uh, a beta functionality within there for COPA publishers. And I think, you know, the transparency that Shai's program offers surrounding COPA compliance could definitely, you know, be valuable to be understood uh, within that uh, platform. For instance, if you load up the Kadoodle TV page from the Publisher Trust Index, I think we ranked eighth globally on Roku uh, last month in the world. Uh, you know, you'll see that we are, are green from a COPA compliance perspective, but uh, you know there is no indication that we are actually you know certified by a third party as being so. Yeah, those are the types of things, and and you know not to to throw our own thing in there, but we do have our publisher trust index, which does the rankings based on quality. We look at quality versus quantity of of uh, eyeballs. So what is brand safe? What's compliant? What's privacy, COPA, et cetera. And those rankings help publishers. If there's a problem, you can fix it. That's the thing is a lot of times you just don't know what the issue is. Let's say it's a privacy policy violation. You might just have the wrong URL or it might be an outdated policy or you might be a publisher that has multiple apps and you're pointing to the wrong privacy policy because each app has to have its own privacy policy, not a parent privacy policy. So those things are fixable and you can go in and make sure that you are presenting yourself. So you can use tools, you know, like KidSafe and like Pixelate um, in our Publisher Trust Index to, to help you uh, navigate those waters. Related to that, to that Calvin, there, there's also now the, the privacy labels and uh, nutrition style labels within the App Store. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenging area of compliance as well, because at the end of the day, you know, getting that right is important. Uh, because if you suggest that you're collecting something within that label or you're not collecting something, and in fact you are, you now have um, a actionable, potentially actionable violation under the Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which is the one that overseas compliance uh, with unfair and deceptive trade practices. So not having a discrepancy there is critical. And there's some tools out there that we can tell you about that help kind of align those two things, the front end nutrition label on the app store with your uh, back end policies and practices. So I guess, you know, on the question of what's next for privacy, um, and this is really open for, for all the panelists to, to talk about, but We've highlighted some, you know, some sort of bigger picture um, items here that we sort of, in the next three to five years, seeing uh, see as important for the industry. Uh, Dan, maybe you want to start with the contextual item. Uh, for sure. I mean, you know, COPA has always been contextually focused, if you will. 
in this the sense that behavioral tar target uh, pardon me targeting is prohibited so we're well prepared uh, you know from from that standpoint to meet the industry shift but I think what we're going to see you know across uh, not only COPA but all audiences is more of a shift towards uh, contextual targeting and you know part of the enablers for that is is for sure big tech uh, you know there's a lot of machine learning and AI technology out there today that is examining content for context and uh, you know there are services in the marketplace like Iris TV, uh, who we are working with at Kadoodle, uh, that help provide you know those contextual match points, if you will, to the programmatic advertising ecosystem, connecting advertisers to content that's being consumed across screens. Uh, but I think uh, you know from a big tech perspective, you know the Amazon fine, for instance, in GDPR, I think it was 880 million uh, euros that was that was fine that's a that's a huge fine and you know big tech is going to have to adapt its uh processes i think to conform to the ever increasing you know privacy framework that's uh being deployed uh globally today uh you know i'm sure shy will have a lot to say but uh there's a recent bill that's been proposed in congress that would extend uh copa legislation to audiences 16 years and under uh, so, you know, that that bill has not been voted on yet, but it will be uh, debated on uh, this year. And, you know, the implications of that to the publishing ecosystem as a whole uh, will be will be massive, some good, some bad. Um, but, you know, a company like Kadoodle TV and the technology that we've developed, we're definitely, you know, well positioned to take the technology that we've developed to date and apply that to to older audiences. You know, thanks for that, Dan. Um, I'm trying to recall the name of that bill. I think it's called, the, I think it actually has the acronym privacy in it. Um, <laughs> so, and it's got some other proposals in there which are concerning for industry. But, you know, I think uh, if you look at the sort of the middle of this slide, we talked a lot about laws um, here in the US at the state level, um, some at the global level. But, but at the end of the day, the 800 pound gorillas in the room still dominate the industry, and that's big tech. Um, they're still sort of controlling what are the requirements within their ecosystems, within their app stores. Uh, this is illustrated by the Apple, the Apple ad transparency, uh, you know, transparency framework where we're now seeing a lot of those pop-ups come up around whether you want to be tracked uh, across apps for advertising purposes. Uh, Apple's got very stringent guidelines for for apps that are in the kids category um, in its in its app store, not allowing for most third party SDKs unless of course you're using Apple's SDK uh, for sign in purposes, which is which is remarkable to me. But um, they're really dominating sort of uh, what are the requirements, what are the guidelines, what are the parameters in which you can launch an app on their ecosystem. And particularly in the kids category and i think we're going to see that trend continue because no one wants to have their their app taken down by the app store by roku um, by google play because uh, that hurts the bottom line and big tech is going to continue to control and dictate what are the rules in this space no matter how you look at it Apple's guidelines do go above and beyond copper requirements in many cases. And uh, at, you know, so regardless of what the laws say, it's gonna be you know, necessary for businesses and app developers on every platform, including CTV, to adhere to whatever the platform requires of them. And I think, you know, to that point, Shai, you know, Apple has really taken a, a blanket approach in regards to opting in or out of advertising. I read some data last week, uh, I forget where it was from, but but it stated that between 60 and 70% of users are opting out of behavioral targeting entirely. Um, I think that's perhaps too blanket of an approach. You know, me as a consumer, I would be comfortable sharing and having targeted ads from certain brands, but not other brands. And, you know, if, once I'm familiar with the brand and I'm familiar with the product and I've used it for a while, you know, there should be the ability for me to say, yes, I will allow targeting from this brand, but, 
you know, not allow targeting from this brand because perhaps I don't trust it yet. Whereas, you know, Apple seems to have taken just that blanket approach of is there targeting or isn't there targeting. So I think we're going to see a future that perhaps gets a li little bit more granular in that regard. And I think we're going to find, to Shai's point that he made earlier, that a lot of users will find that they actually prefer targeted ads, you know, and so they may change those settings in the future. And I think that it's important that big tech makes it easy for users to change those settings. And even the messaging within the uh, pop-up, the prompt that comes up about not being tracked is very tracking focused. There's very little explanation around sort of the benefits, potential benefits of receiving targeted ads and opting into it. And so, you know, messaging is, is important also when it comes to uh, you know, people making their privacy choices. Uh, I think, you know, the last item that we have here, and we've talked about it already, are the changes that are coming to COPPA. The FTC announced what's called a rule review of COPPA back in 2019. This is already now almost two years ago when they made the announcement. They sought public comment from industry, from advocacy groups about what's working with the existing, the current COPPA law, what's not working, what should be changed, what should be uh, kept the same. This came shortly after, or just around the time that the Federal Trade Commission brought the big COPPA lawsuit and settlement against YouTube for $170 million, and which changed the landscape for kids' channels on YouTube and reduced their revenues sizably downward. And so a lot of this was driven by that, whether platforms like YouTube, where perhaps maybe you do or don't have that co-viewing experience that Dan talked about earlier, the FTC didn't buy into it, at least not on mobile and web and desktop, I should say. It didn't buy into it on desktop. And so we saw a big case come out of that and, and the industry shift and this made for kids category uh, develop uh, from YouTube. So I think what will be interesting to see is how that plays out going forward. How does the FTC treat platforms on which you launch third party, on which you have third party content? Uh, the FTC is looking at things like biometrics. Should that be regulated? Uh, should a kid's fingerprint be regulated? Should their face ID be regulated under COPPA? Because uh, the law was last changed in 2013, which is eight years ago. It's already become obsolete. So. There's a lot happening on that front. The FTC has yet to announce a proposed rulemaking uh, of changes to the COPPA rule, but I suspect that will come out probably sometime before the end of this year. And then there will be another public comment period, probably, probably for about three months, possibly another set of changes unless they feel like they got it right the first time, and then probably a grace period before the new law goes into effect. So. By sometime in 2022, I think we are going to see a new version of COPPA. How new and how different it will be remains to be determined, but there will be changes coming in 2022 and companies will need to prepare for that and adjust their app and so will the big tech. So I think we're gonna see more movement in the next year, year and a half on this front. Shy, we got it's, it's representative Kathy Castor protecting the information of our vulnerable children and youth act extended COPPA to 16, 13 to 16 year old audiences. Right. Privacy for short, I think, or kids, privacy kids. I don't know how you, how you get, uh, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, I think it is, I, what's the name of the building? Protecting the, protecting the information of our vulnerable children and youth act. Yeah. I think privacy, A, maybe, I don't know. Anyway. Thank you. Uh, I, we, we've run out of time. Um, we have some questions. We will follow up with these questions personally with everybody. Uh, we have less than 30 seconds here. I just want to thank everyone for attending. I'd like to thank Dan and Shai for uh, participating, uh, which I thought was a really good webinar. Lots of great information. And um, I think there's a, a good bit of stuff we can take from here. Um, and hopefully people found it valuable. Uh, we will be recording this, or we did record this, excuse me. We will be posting it on our website in the next 24 to 48 hours. We will send out a link to everyone uh, that, that attended the webinar and also uh, that had signed up and didn't have the opportunity to attend. Um, thank you, everybody, for a wonderful conversation, and we'll talk to everybody later, and have a nice day.
Bye-bye now. Thank you.